This is the Yay or Nay Show with Alex C. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. And now, here is Alex C. All right, here we go. It is the Yay or Nay Show with Alex C. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. Um, let's get right into some NCAA college basketball. We've got a few things to talk about here. Uh, let's talk about results, first of all. Um, UNC winning big over the team that everybody has been talking about. Uh, and of course I'm discussing St. Peter's, uh, but UNC North Carolina destroying St. Peter's 69 to 49 as it should be. I'll come back to what I mean by that in a minute, because there was a lot of discussion about that game, what the results would be and what it would mean. Uh, Miami got picked off by Kansas 76 to 50 wasn't even close uh, Arkansas played tough went up against Duke but Duke continuing to style and profile getting another victory for coach K 78 69 Houston Villanova the other big game of the afternoon Houston the defensive specialist but they couldn't get anything going offensively they fell to Villanova 50 to 44 now there was a lot of discussion over the weekend. Everybody wanted to talk about Duke. It's all about Duke because of Coach K and the fact that he's retiring. And there's a lot of stuff to be said, and I've been very quiet about Coach K, about the retirement, and there's a lot of stuff to be said about this. First and foremost, you know, for guys who played college basketball and they're currently in the national media now, uh, they have it embedded in their head that, you know, college basketball is like as large as the NBA or the NFL. And it's about one third of the popularity and it's nowhere near the top of mind conversation that the NBA or major league baseball or any other major sport is because again, college basketball is very regional first and foremost, and you have very few people that go to college and very few people go to these particular colleges, especially when you're talking about the big perennials that end up in the you know March Madness tournament, let alone make a run deep into the tournament. So you're talking about a very, very super, 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 super small portion of the population. Let's look at how many people play in the NBA to begin with. A very super, super duper small portion of the population. So when you hear people say things in the national media as if, Everybody is just enamored and it's top of mind. And the only thing on anybody's mind is the NCAA March Madness tournament. That's false. Very, very false. Uh, people watch it. They like it. They engage in it when the games are on. But once the games are over, they're not really engaged in it anymore. It's not a, you know, dinner table conversation. It's not a let's go to the sports bar and talk about the results of today's NCAA March Madness games, that doesn't happen. That's not what people are discussing. Nobody's sitting there talking about even the fact that Coach K is retiring while it is a major event and a big event in college basketball. It's not a major event in the average fan's life. This, again, goes to show you what I continue to say, that the national media, when they do their shows, they're only talking to former players, current players, coaches, general managers, and people who run teams, whether it be collegiately or professionally. So for these guys, Jay Will being one of them, who makes a comment as if everybody's just so enamored by this and they just, they can't wait to, no, that's not even close to being true. Sports fans who are true sports fans, like true hardcore sports fans, you know, they'll watch college basketball, but even, and I am a hardcore sports fan, even a hardcore sports fan like myself, I watch the basketball games, but again, it's not the only thing I'm thinking about. It's not what I'm sleeping, eating, and breathing 24-7, waiting to see the results of the next game. It's not the way it works. Matter of fact, for me, once the University of Arizona got knocked out, my interest went down. And that's what happens to tons of people. When their favorite university gets knocked out, whether they're an alumni or whether they just like the school because their father went there, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, whatever the case may be, the bottom line is once their favorite school gets knocked out, the peak interest that they once shared in the tournament is gone. 
So for people, again, like Jay Will to make a comment that everybody just sitting there at the edge of their seats and they can't wait to see what happens with Duke and they're just, no, that's you because you're an alumnus and you thought it was a big deal. Even when 90 players were at the final home game for Duke and you guys were talking about it, national media now is who I'm speaking to, and they were talking about it and acting as if it was such a big deal. And everybody was so excited. No, the players were excited. The current players were excited. The College Duke itself was excited. America as a whole didn't really care that much. Again, hardcore sports fan, I didn't even watch that game. Didn't care. Didn't care if Duke won. Didn't care if Duke lost. Because that game meant absolutely nothing in the season. Didn't mean anything because it wasn't tournament time. So the fact that it was the final game for Coach K... Nowhere near as significant as the final game in Kobe Bryant's career. Not even close to being on the same plane. But Jay Will wants you to make believe that it is as big as anything in sports, and it's not. Because where I'm going is this St. Peter's, which was a great story. Everybody loved the St. Peter's story, right? But is it really a big story? I mean, because the question was, who did you want to see Duke, if they were able to win and go to the Final Four, who did you want to see him face? Did you want to see him face North Carolina or did you want to see him face St. Peter's? And the debate went on and on and it was endless. And it's like, okay, so now I know you weekend guys, as always, never have nothing to talk about. So you find one thing and you just exhaust it to death because, you know, there wasn't that much to talk about in regards to this particular topic. Because again, St. Peter's is a no-name school, and it's an interesting story. And sometimes it's fun to watch a Cinderella team. And perhaps it would be fun to eventually see a Cinderella team go on and win the national championship. Maybe it'll happen someday, and I'm sure it will because there's always an outlier and there's always an opportunity, and eventually at some point it's going to happen. And here's another problem with national media. When national media talks, they're always talking about headlines, what the story would be, what the story that they would love to tell is, and why they'd like these two teams to play, because then they'll be able to talk about this story, because this is the story that everybody will be talking about leading up to the game. No, only you national media guys get excited about the story of the game. Fans just want to see their favorite teams play. Fans just want to see their favorite teams win. National media loves to tell a story thinking that they're building this hype and this dynamic and there's just so much there and they're able to put something in there that wouldn't exist without them, the national media. False. Garbage. There were a couple of different takes in regards to this deal. As far as Duke, who do they play? Would it be St. Peter's or would it be North Carolina? Which one would be better? But somebody in the national media today backed up where I'm going to go with this and said something that is very, very relevant to show you how Jay Will is only super overexcited about this deal. And he's one of a very small segment of the sports world population that is overly excited about this deal with Duke because he's a former Dukey because here's the bottom line on it. The ratings for St. Peter's games, not very good. Why? America doesn't know who they are. America doesn't care about St. Peter's. St. Peter's is not going to draw viewers to a television to watch a St. Peter's basketball game. North Carolina does. Duke does. Arizona does. Kansas does. But a small little unknown school like St. Peter's, America doesn't care about. The ratings aren't there. So the argument was, some people were saying that, oh, America, they're all about St. Peter's and St. Peter's has all these brand new fans and everybody wants to see St. Peter's against Duke. And just imagine if St. Peter's can send Coach K packing in the Final Four and make their way into the national championship. Great, then nobody will watch. Why would they? Nobody cares about St. Peter's. Nobody believes in St. Peter's. Nobody's going to believe in a small school like St. Peter's a team that was like, what, 12 and 11 a month before the tournament, tournament even started? And their record is 22 and 12? And you think people are going to care and think that they're a national title team for reals? 
No. You think people are going to watch? No, they're not. But, you know, you had a certain segment of the national media, especially on the four-letter network, and they were screaming about how everybody would want to see St. Peter's versus Duke, and nobody's going to want to see North Carolina and Duke again. And, again, the argument is, for St. Peter's, you had a team who's an unknown making a Cinderella run, and allegedly, according to these guys, everybody in America was a fan of them. Everybody in America would have loved to see them move on. Everybody would have loved to see them facing Duke. And then again, a no-name school versus Duke to see who's going to the national title game. Does that really sound like something everybody wants to see? And then you got North Carolina and Duke. They're one and one. They got a split this year, right? So North Carolina ruined Coach K's final game at home by beating Duke. Duke won against North Carolina in North Carolina. So one and one. North Carolina has been playing extremely, extremely well since they've beaten Duke. Duke has been paying, playing extremely, extremely well since they lost to North Carolina. It's a split game. They are rivalries. One of the oldest rivalries in the country. North Carolina, Duke, rivalry game. Now decided it is going to be North Carolina, Duke, final four, deciding who's going on to play for the national championship. If St. Peter's would have won, again, the key is if St. Peter's would have won, do you really think America would care? Again, maybe there would have been some that would have thought, wow, this is great, but do you really think a bunch of eyeballs were going to be glued? Ratings for the St. Peter's games were garbage. Nobody cared. Nobody watched. Even after it was already announced that they were making a Cinderella run, ratings weren't there. And I'm getting this information from another national media person who took another take on a different side, more along mine than with the four-letter networks, and saying that the ratings weren't there for St. Peter's games. Nobody cared. North Carolina games, people care. Duke games, people care. But if Duke were going to play against St. Peter's, and in, instead of playing against North Carolina, who do you think the people would want to watch? Who do you think the people would watch? Who do you think would attract ratings? Would it be St. Peter's against Duke or would it be North Carolina against Duke? Again, lots of stories, lots of stuff. North Carolina, first year coach. Could he possibly on his first year advance his team all the way to the national championship? Uh, could he also be the one to put out Coach K and North Carolina again being the big bad, uh, the one that Duke has constantly and consistently been in contention with for over three decades. And it's been, you know, one of the biggest rivalries in college basketball and Duke beating North Carolina, advancing coach K to the national title would be big. But again, when you sit and think about it, and I was listening to these arguments all weekend long, you got to look at, who people want to see and who people want to see is going to be dictated by ratings. And again, no ratings for St. Peter's games, ratings for North Carolina, ratings for Duke. That, that, that answers the question. That's everything you want to know. So for, for all these guys in the national media that were trying to feed you all this garbage about how everybody would want to see St. Peter's and everybody would be bored by North Carolina and Duke. Why would you be bored by two perennial powerhouses going at it to see who's going to the national championship? And why is it that when you don't have perennial powerhouses in playoffs, whether it be football, baseball, basketball, the ratings are lower than when you have people who are not powerhouses? So, again, it's only obvious that the argument for St. Peter's to play against Duke being the game that everybody in America would want to see is a bunch of garbage and a bunch of blasphemy. Because if that would be the case... People would have watched St. Peter's games in the tournament, but nobody watched the games, so they had no ratings because nobody cares about St. Peter's, a school that nobody knows anything about. They got, what, 3,000 students in the whole campus, right? They don't have anybody going to the NBA. I don't think they've ever sent anybody to the NBA. So nobody cares about St. Peter's. They're a small school, and they got destroyed and hammered by North Carolina like they should have. 
They got beat by 20 points because that is the level of competition that St. Peter's can bring when it comes to playing against the big boys. And when they went up against the big boys, because they had kind of a soft schedule up to now, when they went up against the big boys, they got blasted by 20 points. And North Carolina put St. Peter's in their place where they belong, out of the tournament. However, I will say this. If St. Peter's were to beat a perennial like North Carolina in order to advance against Duke, there would be two schools of thought that people would take when you would look at that matchup. They would say it was either a fluke that they beat North Carolina, and I think you would have more people that think that than anything, or there would be people that would take notice of St. Peter and think that maybe this is your next Gonzaga, but I'll bet you bottom dollar that still there would have been no eyeballs, no ratings for a Duke versus St. Peter's game. There's going to be a lot of eyeballs and a lot of ratings for Duke versus North Carolina, a big rivalry match with Coach K possibly winning his way into the national championship by beating his biggest rival of his career. That is a bigger game and a better story than Coach K possibly winning his way in to the national championship by beating a lowly 15 seed in St. Peter's with a bunch of no-name guys that you're never going to see on an NBA floor. So that argument, after listening to everything, and I heard it all, but it all comes down to ratings. And ratings destroy any argument that any of these national media guys over the weekend tried to make for St. Peter's going up against Duke and then trying to convince you that that's what America wanted to see. If America wanted to see it, then some of these other games that St. Peter's played in would have actually had some ratings. I just wanted to make sure that I got that in real quick because that was driving me nuts because those guys wouldn't shut up about it all weekend long. It's all you heard about. It was as if it was the only thing they had to talk about. They didn't have anything to discuss. It was St. Peter's. It was Duke. It was the history of North Carolina versus Duke. And then it was how St. Peter's, though, Cinderella story, supposedly everybody wanted to hear it. And then they kept putting callers on the air, and all they kept hearing was Duke versus North Carolina. Couldn't find very many people that said St. Peter's. So it was just amazing. The garbage, the blasphemy. Uh, Flipping over to the NFL really quickly, Detroit Lions are going to be featured in Hard Knocks for the 2022 training camp. Um, The announcement just came out recently. Uh, Again, they're going to be uh, featured in the training camp version of Hard Knocks. And based on the NFL rules for ensuring cooperation with the show, the Lions were one of three teams that could not turn down an invitation from the documentary series that follows NFL teams throughout training camp. The other two were the Carolina Panthers and the New York Jets. Uh, A major part of the Lions' allure is Coach Dan Campbell, whose colorful news conferences and unique uh, aphorisms brought levity and interest to his 313-1 debut with the Lions last season. In a statement, Lions president and CEO Rod Wood said, We're excited about the opportunity to showcase the city of Detroit and the amazing culture we are building at the Lions. Uh, HBO Sports and the NFL Films are the best of the best, and we know they will be excellent partners in sharing our story with football fans around the world. The Lions will be the 15th NFL team to have appeared on the season of Hard Knocks. The Dallas Cowboys have appeared three times, including last year while the L.A. Rams and Cincinnati Bengals have done it twice apiece. Last fall, the Indianapolis Colts Colts were the subject of the first in-season version of the show. It's unclear whether that format will be reprised in 2022. So again, you're looking at the Detroit Lions being featured in the training camp version of Hard Knocks. So It's always been kind of a bad luck thing to be featured in Hard Knocks. Look at what happened to Indianapolis last year, and we could go down the list, and that's always been a topic of conversation in regards to teams uh, getting featured in Hard Knocks. So will it be just another bad season for Detroit? Eh, Probably, but I don't know that it's really going to have anything to do with Hard Knocks, to be honest. I mean, let's face it, we are talking about Detroit. Uh, Flipping over to Major League Baseball really quickly, Uh, Cattell Marte and the Arizona Diamondbacks have agreed to an extension that includes $51 million in new money. Uh, The agreement, which totals five years and is worth $76 million, 
covers two existing options for years 2023 and 2024 and also adds on 2025, 26, and 27 to the Marte contract. Uh, the 28-year-old Marte was one of the few bright spots on the Diamondbacks team that won just 52 games last season, hitting 318 with 52 runs, and he scored 50 RBIs despite dealing with multiple hamstring injuries that kept him to just 340 at bats. So the Diamondbacks, again, arguably one of the worst organizations in baseball. Keep in mind, I live in the 602, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and making another stupid decision by extending the general manager who has been the GM since 2016. And since 2016, this team has done nothing in this offseason. They have continued to do nothing, and they have continued to show you that they are not going to be a team that's in contention for anything this year. Uh, they're already looking as horrific as ever in spring training. Um, it's going to be another long season for the Diamondbacks. Yay, you signed Cattell Marte, but you also re-signed your losing general manager who, as a loser, will continue to be a loser and continue to make the Arizona Diamondbacks a loser as he has since 2016. So big congratulations to the Arizona Cardinals for really doing nothing in the offseason and absolutely nothing. Uh, moving over to the NFL Kyler Murray. All right. Last week, after I continued uh, my weekend, I was looking at stuff and I saw a story and it said uh, Kyler Murray finally breaks silence on why he deleted the Cardinals from his Instagram. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of this to you and then I'm going to tell you my thoughts. So the story goes, Kyler Murray raised some eyebrows around the NFL in early February when he decided to make some major modifications to his social media pages. Not only did he unfollow the Cardinals on Twitter, but he also deleted all his team-related photos from his personal Instagram account. Although Murray would later restore the deleted photos, he still hasn't explained why he deleted them in the first place, and that's mostly because he hasn't really been available for any interviews over the past six weeks. Well, that changed uh, last Thursday when Murray finally was willing to answer some questions about his social media activities during a press conference at a charity event. Um, the quarterback did release a vague statement on February 14th, but he didn't really offer any explanation for his actions. So why did he scrub the Cardinals from his social media account? The two-time Pro Bowler didn't have a great explanation. If you're a kid my age, you're used to like people take off all their content. content. That's just a thing, Murray said. Honestly, like I said, I took everything off of it besides one picture, so it had nothing to do with the Cardinals or anything like that. Uh, Murray might try to insist that it had nothing to do with the Cardinals, but his actions over the past six weeks would seem to indicate otherwise. Back on February 28th, Murray's agent, uh, Eric Burkhart, sent out a lengthy statement that called on the Cardinals to give the quarterback an extension. The statement also called on the team to show that they're serious about winning a Super Bowl. Look, here's the thing with this. Kyler Murray, and reading the statement is hard, okay? Reading the statement. Let me read this to you one more time. This is how bad this statement is. If you're a kid my age, you're used to, like, people take off all their, that's just the thing, Murray said. Honestly, like I said, I took everything off of it besides one picture, so it had nothing to do with the Cardinals or anything like that. That's just a hard read. That whole statement is just a hard read. But here's the funny part. So you remove everything from social media, Kyler Murray, and then immediately your agent puts out a demand for you to get a brand new contract. And then you and your agent put out examples of what quarterbacks you think you're close to and what kind of pay you think you should be getting. And they need to hurry up and make a deal and show you that they are serious about making a Super Bowl run. Okay. So there's so many levels to go over when we're talking about this deal here. There are so many different levels to go over when we're talking about this deal. For instance, um, Kyler Murray, uh, you were the failure that failed the Arizona Cardinals last year. Here, let me put it even easier to you because there's another discussion to be had and we're going to get into it, believe me. Uh, we're going to talk about positions in football and I'm going to tell you how the NFL analysts, the so-called experts, have it all wrong about what the most important position in football is. There are multiple, multiple important positions. Um, 
And I'll even say that there are multiple positions that I believe are more important than the one that the national media tells you is the most important position in football. But again, today's not the day, but it probably will be this week when we get into that conversation. But here's the thing. So Kyler Murray deletes this stuff from all of his social media accounts. Immediately, there's demands for a new contract. But Kyler Murray is the failure. Kyler Murray, for three seasons, has shown you, number one, not a leader of men. Number two, as immature as an immature little kid can be. It's funny that he used the example in his statement, if you're a kid my age. And there's the problem. You are a kid. You're immature. You need to grow up ASAP. Or you're going to be just like the boy who came out one year ahead of you with a franchise that doesn't want him in the Cleveland Browns. That's what Kyler Murray is going to be. Matter of fact, I'll make the argument now that if next season another quarterback like Deshaun Watson becomes available, the Arizona Cardinals will definitely be looking to see if they could get his services before they offer Kyler Murray any kind of a contract. So that's just what you're looking at, Kyler Murray. You need to grow up. You're not a leader of men. You're really not well-liked in the locker room. There isn't anybody in that locker room running out to your defense talking about what a great leader you are, how they're ready to follow you to the promised land, how they believe that you're the guy that can lead them to the promised land because you're not the guy. And the fans don't believe it either. Believe me, I've been reading a lot of the social media posts and stuff that's going on. And all the people that I normally see talk nothing but positive things about the Arizona Cardinals don't have positive things to say about Kyler Murray because the fans recognize he's not a leader of men. He's too short, and he is not that good of a quarterback. He has been overhyped, overpromoted, and he has underdelivered for what the local media has tried to feed to this market about how good Kyler Murray actually is when, in fact, Kyler Murray actually is not. That is the mistake the local media has made. But the fans, they're no fools. They know. You deleted this stuff from your social media so you and your agent could make demands and try and force the Cardinals to give you a deal which you're not even ready to get. It would be a foolish, foolish sack of money to waste on you by offering you an extension at this point in your career. This is a prove-it year for Kyler Murray, and I don't think he's going to prove it. And here's the deal, because Kyler Murray, just to show you how he is maybe a barely above average quarterback, serviceable, obviously he could be a franchise quarterback, he's serviceable, but he's not a guy who can lead you to the promised land. Because there is a wide receiver who went down last year who amazingly, as soon as DeAndre Hopkins goes down, Kyler Murray can't seem to win any games. You even got beat by the lowly Detroit Lions. You got embarrassed by the Detroit Lions, and you looked pathetic as a quarterback against the Detroit Lions. So... Without a super dynamic triple A wide receiver like DeAndre Hopkins, Kyler Murray is just an average quarterback. It's DeAndre Hopkins that is making Kyler Murray look good. Kyler Murray does not elevate teammates. Kyler Murray does not do well as a leader of men. Kyler Murray is immature. And Kyler Murray lets his emotions show on the sidelines and you could tell that people are disgusted by it because you could see how nobody's ever standing next to him. He's always by himself sulking because he's immature. And without DeAndre Hopkins there to make Kyler Murray look good, Kyler Murray is just an average or maybe a little above average quarterback with great elusive skills that he can avoid getting sacked, but he's too short, can't see over the line of scrimmage, can't throw over the line of scrimmage. Uh, and without a super dynamic wide receiver like DeAndre Hopkins to make Kyler Murray look good, he's a, a maybe just minimally above average quarterback. Not to mention when you got a coach who also foolishly got an extension to 2027 along with a general manager, Steve Kime, who should not have gotten an extension to 2027, and you got a coach 
that isn't really a good coach because, again, when plays work, it's because DeAndre Hopkins is on a scramble drill off another broken play, and then Kyler Murray is able to deliver the ball because he does have an accurate arm, and he does have a good arm, and he does have a cannon for an arm. But it's DeAndre Hopkins with his making 50-50 jump balls look like 70-30s because that's how athletic and how good DeAndre Hopkins is. And it's DeAndre Hopkins getting elusive and getting away from the defense to give a wide open target to a broken play that makes Kyler Murray look like he's achieving something. It's DeAndre Hopkins making Cliff Kingsbury look good and making Kyler Murray look good. Because Cliff Kingsbury, his play selection, his game planning, it's average at best. Average at best. And you saw how average it is without what? DeAndre Hopkins. Because there are a lot of people on the NFL analyst side that will tell you that the game plans that they were playing against these teams without DeAndre Hopkins were head scratchers. And then you saw how bad Kyler Murray is at playing without DeAndre Hopkins. So you got a coach being exposed at how he's really an a below average coach in the NFL. And you got a quarterback who's showing you that he's average to maybe a little above average because of his speed and his elusiveness. Can't stay healthy, though, because of his size. But his speed and his elusiveness. And he's got an accurate arm, a very accurate arm. But without a triple A wide receiver like DeAndre Hopkins, he could be minimally above average at best. So without DeAndre Hopkins, you take DeAndre Hopkins out of that offense and you see what you have in a head coach below average and a quarterback who's average to maybe a little above average at best, but that's with DeAndre Hopkins in the lineup. Bottom line is, Kyler Murray, it's time to grow up and it's a make it or break it year for you. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, we will do it all again tomorrow. This is Yay or Nay Show with Alex C.